Okay, well, our, our format here was to each talk a little bit and then talk among ourselves, but, but I think it's time for you guys to talk to us, mm -hmm. ask questions. You're here because you had an interest, so let's hear the questions, and we may not have an answer, but we'll discuss them. Okay, go ready. Okay, um, I would like to add uh, another part for the discussion, but first I would like just to add some statistics. I, I might not have them quite right, but um, on the line of how farming is not very... Uh, profitable. Uh, I think in Kentucky we have something like 76,000 farmers and I think 54% of them uh, have less than uh, living wage, that means less than an income of $21,000 just to say that yes we know that farming is not profitable and a lot of those have one or two or three jobs mm -hmm. supported by, by the wife so, so a, a typical small farm home has two to three jobs plus their farm typically to make it. That's just to underline how little uh, income there is and to put it in perspective. Then on the other hand, we have about, in the other end, we have about, I think, 6,000 farmers in Kentucky that makes more than 500,000 on income, just to say how divided, how different farming is that way. And of course, those who have that bigger income is a totally different um, type of people. Um, but so I, 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 we, we have farm too, and I stopped doing uh, meat cattle because I wasn't paid for quality. And I, I'm not as timid as some of you guys. I, I think we need to work together to say we, we, we need to be paid for quality. And I think that's something that is wrong here. We, we don't have tradition. I'm from Denmark. We, we are out of cooperatives uh, working together. We Farmers here have not been very good to one another, honestly, and not very supportive. And they just are more proud being individualist, they think, is better. So they, they could, uh, through the years, like some of in the tobacco industry, they work together and they, they got better pricing. It was the only thing that was profitable for farmers, that was tobacco. But uh, uh, even, so even you have, you use sustainable methods and uh, have good quality, we are not paid for it. And I think it's wrong. And so how do we, so I would like to add that to the discussion. Uh, you have outlined a dilemma that has been in American agriculture as long as there has been. American agriculture and and sort of that individualistic market driven economy has created certain certainly those inequities that you have described um, because we we have not I mean 110 years ago in Western Kentucky they fought what some of you remember we read about the Black Patch Wars it was when tobacco farmers were trying to get together but yet you had other farmers who wouldn't go along and it actually evolved into armed combat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have a, a rather sordid history about some of those things. Uh, attempts to do those things at the cooperative level or at the, at the control level of the government have had very sometimes mixed results. The tobacco program came out of government programming that was, I think, a very good program that kept that had really good income distributional effects. It was flawed, so it was actually sort of going to self-destruct on its own because of some things that weren't right about that. Uh, that is, there are no easy solutions to that. And in, and, and please don't kill the messenger here, I'm sort of describing, it's like describing gravity to somebody who's just fallen and broken their leg. Uh, <laughs> markets are not very nice. <laughs> markets have no morals, no scruples, no conscience. And, and one of the sad things, Cody, is, is if, if Joel Salatin was making a lot of money, and let's take the development pressure out of it, if, if there was a lot of profits, Chris, in farming, you know what would happen to land? The market would bid the price up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so land, in, in, in essence, is, is what we're here for, but it's also part of the problem. So if, I w there is no easy solution to what you've does, just described. It's, it's there. I, I want to make one other quick point relative to what uh, Cody has talked about, the difficulty of getting started farming, because I think it relates back to this notion of being able to make a living on the farm. Uh, in Cody's lifetime, he's probably never heard anybody say this unless he heard me say it somewhere along the line. 
some of you here have enough gray hair to probably have heard someone say, if you can't do anything else, you can farm. Mm -hmm. Anybody hear that? Have you heard it said lately? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. You've heard it said lately? Oh, yeah. If I got a million dollars, I'm going to farm until it falls out. Until it runs out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, that, that bugs me. Yeah. It's it bugs me a joke, but it bugs me. Yeah, it, it does. But I used to think that that saying in and of itself was an expression of ability. If you couldn't do anything else, you could farm. Yeah. It dawned on me at some point in time that had nothing to do with ability or capacity. It had much more to do with the acceptance of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That I can raise a garden, I can put a roof over my head, but I won't have much else. So it was that acceptance mm -hmm. of that lifestyle rather than some mm -hmm. expression of ability. And I think that's why you don't hear people say that, except in the context that you just described, that, that we have very few people who are, are willing or, or should be asked to do that. Our parents and grandparents live very poor sometimes. So, so there are some dilemmas here that have no easy answers. You know what, part of that? So I'm, I guess, observant enough to realize that yes, farmers are cutthroat, and if you can raise it for a dollar, I can raise it for 98 cents. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's just the way that it is. And the market will pay 98 cents instead of a dollar. Exactly. Um, and so so that's, I realize that. And I guess I'm just observant enough to see it. And so I think that a lot of, I guess, my peers, those, those of us who are younger and are, are trying to make a living at agriculture, we are really looking for premium markets. So if the market is not paying for beef cattle done the way I think it should be done, and it can't, the market is not supporting it, the price is not supporting it at the cost that it takes to produce it, well, I'm going to find something else to do. I'm going to start doing locally processed beef and selling it out of the freezer, or I'm going to do uh, produce, or I'm going to do something, some other kind of agriculture that's going to pay the bill because my generation, we don't like to. What was the quote earlier? Uh, live, live, live poor and die rich. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. <laughs> My wife and I are comfortable with a lower income type lifestyle. Uh, but most of my peers want to drive nice vehicles. They want to live, live rich and die, die rich. Uh, and so, so most of us, we're going to find something that's going to pay. You mentioned earlier that, that a lot of farming is done based on the, the bottom line, and that's true. Uh, a lot of it is based on the bottom line, uh, but but I think among the millennial generation, a lot of us are, are probably a little more concerned with the way things are done than the generation before us, which is the generation that's in their 30s and 40s, which are probably the majority of the large active farmers, uh, but my generation of millennials that are starting to come into their mid to late 20s, we're more concerned about the way things are done, but we also have to be concerned about the, the income. Other, other questions, comments, observations? I'm yes, curious sir. about the, the extent uh, that corporations are investing in farms in Kentucky. Is there a long-term trend towards consolidation and incorporation of farmland? Or <clears throat> with all this difficulty that we're seeing with transfer of land to the younger generation, the only ones who can make a profit are the ones that have large acreage and the equipment? Well, and certainly in commodity agriculture where economies of scale that have some merit in terms of paying those bills. Uh, consolidation, yes. Uh, corporate investment, not a great deal. Uh, because let's face it, a lot of venture capital or, or, uh, or corporate money uh, would be attracted to things that have a higher rate of return mm -hmm. because the long run rate of return to assets in agriculture is somewhere in the, in the mid single digits, uh, you know, sort of three to five percent. And that's not the kind of rate of return, even in, in larger scale agriculture, that's likely to attract a lot of outside investment. Mm -hmm. So you hear that from time to time, and a few years ago, 20, 
10, 11, 12, 13, when land values were, were skyrocketing, there were a lot of outside investors looking at that, but they were looking at it in terms of what the land values were going to do, not necessarily what those returns were. And those were some good return uh, years in agriculture. Uh, but uh, Chris is wanting to chime in here. Let's see what she has to say. We went to a conference and one of those organizations was there and my, my children took pictures of their, their uh, uh, you know, information and with all their figures on it and everything. <coughs> and so we went home with all those pictures and we were sitting around the supper table and we ran the numbers. And <laughs> We concluded that anybody like like Cody, anybody that was doing the hands-on, it would take maybe two years, at most four years, before they were completely broke. There was no way that anybody could could keep paying uh, uh, what what they demanded to to keep there. It was it was it was awful. It was. And, and, and then the stories began coming out about uh, a lot of the people that came from the Philippines that took part in some of those things. And it was, it was obscene what happened to those people. So I think that if you're gonna have a, if you're gonna have a co-op, it ought to come from the bottom. It ought to be people like Cody getting together. And that's, that's where it ought to come from rather than top right. down but maybe that's impossible too. Okay. Okay. So when, you, when you talk about, I want to build on that concept of co-op, because <clears throat> I don't know a lot about farming, but I am curious what Ag Extension and, and other advocacy groups or groups that represent farmers are doing to create cooperatives for younger farmers who are wanting to do just what you're talking about. If that's if that's the place for it to be done, I mean, who who can be the leaders in getting those co-ops developed? Even if it's a grassroots effort, it seems like there needs to be somebody kind of taking the leadership on that. Uh, and there are, and and I think in a few years, and when I retire, I want to teach an ag history class. I, I really think the study of agricultural history in this country would be a fascinating topic to just have some discussions like this, and and and, and certainly. The, the cooperative model really looks good, it has a lot of merit, and it's hard to find very many successful co-ops. Because you know, one of the things that, that, that Cody mentioned, you know, you've got problems like free riders, you've got externalities, you've got folks who want to go around the system because they think they can produce it a little cheaper. It's, it's, it is a wonderful idea that has had great difficulty in becoming established and, and sus the sustainability of co-ops has been very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Apart from, apart from co-ops, is there any kind of organization in Kentucky that's bringing together older farm owners and younger people who want to farm? Is there, I know there's a national organization that does that, but is there anything here in Kentucky? Uh, not that I'm aware of in, in that sense, and maybe someone in the audience does. I, I do know, to their credit, uh, several farm credit organizations have uh, what are called Young Beginning and Small Farm programs mm -hmm. to offer some better terms. Uh, Cody mentioned FSA, Farm Credit mm -hmm. System has a, a YBS program. Uh, and, and I do know that nationally there are some efforts. I, I jumped down earlier here a minute ago that, that in the transition workshops, I tried to make this point. The fact that three-fourths of all land does transfer to family members doesn't mean that it has to. Mm. And I think farmers finding folks like Cody, their kids don't want to farm, but Cody does. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, several years back, uh, Nebraska actually had a state law that if you leased, if you were a landowner and leased to someone with less than 10 years farming experience, there was a waiver on the, the taxes on those on that rental income so that was sort of an institutional thing to encourage young farming so uh, uh, but so there are some things out there Any, anybody else familiar with anything or or have a well I, I would like to just uh, adjust on when I was talking about cooperatives uh, it was really not 
a suggestion for farmers to turn into cooperative structure. It was uh, to discuss, I still believe we need to be paid more. And what I talked about, referred to in, in Denmark or other places, it is that you have the processing plan. Mm -hmm. Those who are taking care of the sale, we could here be feedlots, the bigger feedlots. It could be the processing, slaughterhouses, processing plants, uh, the, the, the retail sale that is owned partly by, by farmers. That's where uh, the value comes in. So farmers get more in charge. I think we are too kind. I did find a different way to do. I'm not, our farms not given away. I found another solution, sure. But what I want, would like people, farmers, to think more about is that we have a right to, to look at our farm produce as a business product and not just accept it to be a commodity as so much of it has been, but if you do prime beef or you do specialty chickens or pork, it, it's not a commodity. And But we have no no um, control over the prices, and that's where I, I think that in order to solve the farm situation, we have to have more control over how we, we are paid, how we sell. And that's another discussion. <coughs> that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> Uh, no, and I understand that. And, and farmers have long been regarded as price takers rather than price setters. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm about to step in it now. The only thing worse that farmers are worse at than taking prices is setting prices. <laughs> <laughs> because the ones who have some market power tend to do like Cody said, and, and it, it's not based on setting a price that's profitable, but it's setting a price that's cheaper than my competitor. And, and that becomes an issue. So sometimes we would like to be able to set prices, but rarely do farmers have much of a track record at setting them at a level that is profitable because we're trying to move the product. So I, I, I didn't mean to be an old grousy cynic in that, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I, that, that, is a, that is a very difficult thing for farmers to, to try to do short of having some sort of supply control system or some sort of price management system. There are some marketing boards on some specialty products that have had some success doing that, but it is not by any means the norm because, like Cody said, somebody if he can pre he'll sell it for a dollar. It's probably somebody who'll sell it for ninety-eight cents. That's one of the ones that are market. Okay. Just to have a couple more minutes, maybe one or two more questions or comments. Yes. I got a comment on. Um, I am a landowner, and I hate to see good farmland developed, but I would never impose that responsibility on my children or whoever is going to inherit the land. I am totally against it for ethical and moral reasons, actually. I'm totally against that. It, uh, I don't have the answer. I don't like it either, but I'm not going to put it on my kids. And the Sister Claire's comment, uh, young people trans going to own ownership of land, the closest thing that I know would be the Berry Center if you're looking for somebody to take over, the, an older farmer looking for somebody to take over. There's not much out there. It's up to the landowner and the farmer to get out there and do it. They are out there. There's plenty of people out there like Cody that want to farm, but it's up to the landowner to get out there and search them out. But there is a, uh, I guess you would call it an investment group, but I, some of you may be familiar with Organic uh, Iroquois Valley. Iroquois Valley is sort of an investment group, and basically their, their model is um, they, they have investors, and they purchase land, um, but they don't purchase that land just willy-nilly. They purchase land that a young farmer is already, or a, a young farmer or a young farm family is already interested in, okay? So they're basically the, they're the lending agent. Uh, so they purchase the land, the young farmer farms the land and pays a lease payment for a certain number of years at which at the end of that period of time 
they have the option to then buy that land. Um, and so there, it is an investment type program, um, but it's not an investment program where they're expecting large dividends. It's just a, it's, it's a, it's a safe place to put money in, a, in, a, in sort of a sense. Uh, and they are operating in this area, or they're, they're trying to operate in this area. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of them. They typically uh, mandate organic production, but I think they have relaxed that rule a little bit. Uh, but again, their name is Iroquois Valley. Yeah. Iroquois. Say it again. Iroquois. I can't. I'm not sure how to spell it. I R I Q U. And that was the one that we took their figures and we figured you'd last two to four years. Oh. Okay. <laughs> My closing comment was, would be this. I think most of you are here on a stormy, rainy night because you have an interest in the land and, and how that's going to go in the future to perhaps uh, your offspring. Uh, I have uh, worked on several occasions with Chris, and sh she and her family have done something that I encourage other families to do, and sometimes they don't do it very well. She mentioned the number of times that they've had meetings and discussions, and you talked about having quarterly meetings. Uh, I have a slide in my presentation when I do the PowerPoint that, that has the, the reason that, that succession planning is not successful, and there's a number of reasons that I put in there, but the one that I have at the bottom, and I have it in bold type, and I have it in red, is failure to communicate. I would encourage you to communicate up and down the generational ladder and make sure everybody understands that. The, the, the line that I use, and I have this on another slide, is almost the worst thing that that parents or grandparents can say in a conversation is, don't worry, I'll take care of you. That means, don't ask me about that again. Yeah. Yeah. So in her case, her kids do not have to worry about being taken care of. They know. They have had discussions. I've been at the table with her kids, and, and they talk, and they talk very candidly. So if I were going to give any one bit of closing advice, it is have open lines of communication and talk about what folks want. Both generations, or three generations, or four generations, talk about it, communicate. I think that's important. So, look. We do have our quarterly meetings. And, uh, and I know that when my son starts the sentence with, now, Mom, <laughs> that's the clue for me to go get my notebook because I have to take some notes because I'm going to get some suggestions about things that I'm to do. <laughs> and so, but, but it is quite wonderful. And, and I have reaped wonderful benefits from this. We, uh, we incorporate the farm, it's an S-Corp. And so we really do legally have to yeah. have to have farm meetings. And we, we have minutes and we type them up and every now and then we'll put a picture or two in there with it. So you've got a real history of what has gone on. But it's been a wonderful, marvelous experience and brought me very much closer to my children. And uh, uh, although I agree for the condition of, I think, agriculture in general, uh, I have great hopes that, that we, can, we can get this ship turned around somehow or other and, and produce really good food and support the young farmers. We've got to support the young farmers. That's a close remark. We will. Um, Sister Claire, thank you very much for having oh, wait, us. Wait, oh, I'm said, sorry. He, what are you, what's he saying? What are you saying? We, what? I, I just wanted to hear what you said. We will turn it around. It, it, it will happen. It, it, it's not sustainable the way it is. And the whole system is going to turn over. I think. I'm optimistic about farming. Good. I'm not doom and gloom. There's opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. There are indeed. That's what keeps me yeah. standing in front of classes at the University of Kentucky and having students like 
Cody and his wife Angela. That, that's what I live for. Thank you for coming out, Sister Claire. Thanks for having us. I want to turn it back to you. Uh, but uh, thank you for your presence. Thank you, each one of you. Please, Chris, On the one hand, I do grieve. And I, I fear that the individualism of the farmer is merely a microcosm of the individual, individualism of our nation. And that if we cannot break through that individualism, there is no hope for the future. But you all are breaking through in each of your different ways. You're doing that breaking through process and you're holding out images of we don't know how to do it, but we've got to be able to do it. And we will do it, as Arthur says. So it's kind of a, a mixture of a lot of um, different dimensions at this point. But, um, and I also thank each of you for being here tonight on this cold, rainy night. I hope we'll all be safe getting home. And I would ask you to please, we're trying to learn a new skill at New Pioneers that we need to keep data and be able to provide data to funding organizations. So if you wouldn't mind filling out that little tiny piece of paper, you just have to make four circles on it and pass it to the end of your table. We'll pick them up. And this is the beginning of a new um, version of New Pioneers Point Two. So thank you again. We, um, we, we know what we're doing is the right thing to be doing. So the fact that we don't know how to do it just motivates us to work harder at it. Thank you and good night. Thank you.